Hello and welcome to this latest Business Spotlight interview. Uh, I'm delighted today to be joined by Mike, Mark Keating, co-owner of Shadowcat Systems Limited, an open source software development consultancy based in Lancaster. Hi Mark, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Very good this morning, thank you. Excellent, good to hear, good to hear. So yes, um, so if you could just start with the first question is always about, you know, the background, yourself and the business, it just gives you a flavour of, you know, where, where the business has come from and, and your role in that. Okay, so it's a, an interesting sort of um, development of how we came about. I was working as a publishing company. Um, I was uh, editing and setting books um, and working with book clients. I also designed covers, um, did a lot of the commission as well. Um, it was a very small local company and uh, we needed a technical website. We needed wanted to sell books on the website. Um, this was around about the year 2000, 2001. Mm. Um, and I knew uh, a lad called Matt who worked at... Um, a company, local company in Lancaster doing websites. He was very, very young, very, very keen, very unusual. I met him through a tabletop role-playing game group. Uh -huh. um, and he basically was technically minded. So I said, can you help me with this? And that was it. We built a bespoke site for the publishing company. Uh, we kind of like working together. So we did another one for another publishing company that I knew and have worked with. Uh -huh. And out of that, he then said, um, well, I want to farm a company, but I don't want to deal with people. And you seem to be able to talk to people. So would you come into business with me? You can do the stop talking to people and some of the front end design because I work with um, things like HTML, CSS, tiny bit of JavaScript, and he would do the back end stuff. And that's how we, we came about, really. That's how we started. So we started working together in 2001, formed the company in 2005. Okay. So fairly early days of, of you know, so, I mean, it, it doesn't seem a long time ago, but it's kind of 20. 25 years ago, now, right? <laughs> it's 25 years ago. It doesn't seem that long until you actually put no, them say 2001, it's 2000, and you're like, wow, that's <laughs> kind of puts things in perspective. So, um, I guess, um, an interesting kind of combination. So, the kind of the, the profiles of yourself and and Matt kind of work really well together because you kind of work together. Um, yeah, he's a, an interesting person in that is, um, like most people with a, a high level of intelligence, he got some very unusual quirks. Yeah. He was originally the youngest person to start an open university degree at 10 years old. Wow. Um, yeah, so he did that in pure maths. Um, whereas I did a degree in literature, so we couldn't be more poles apart in terms of um, studies of academic studies. But yeah. I think that's actually fairly complimentary because yeah. I've always had a love and big interest in science and science fiction. And he's always had a big love and interest in art. So he likes people like Terry Pratchett, Neil Gaiman, lots of different artists. Right. So that kind of fused together. So yeah. he satisfies my scientific side and mathematical side, and I satisfy his literature and yeah. artistic side. Perfect. So how? So what was the catalyst to decide to go for it? So, so 2001, then 2005, you decided to... To set the business up what, what there were various numbers of catalysts a lot of it was personal it was more that matt couldn't work at traditional businesses right um it, they just he is a very talented person but however that meant that he came, he came across a couple of unscrupulous bosses right. who would just give him task after task and because he was able to achieve them they gave him more task right. and more responsibility and actually he responded very very negatively to that um so it didn't actually help in any way. And he knew that he couldn't work at a traditional com company anymore. It just didn't fit his mindset. Yeah. It's great that you've obviously you built the trust up with him for, you know, for him to approach you and, and have that conversation. And Yeah, yeah. I think we, we'd already built up quite a good friendship, to be honest, of similar tastes in music, a lot of similar tastes in art and literature. Um, also, things like favourite philosophers. We have right. discussions over what philosophy we like he likes the philosophers of the 19th century so um he's very very much into that right okay. um, and rationalism and i kind of like the um well i kind of like the reformation which is around the same sort of part time period yeah um and a kind of complementary understanding of things yeah, yeah fantastic and obviously the, the relationship is still going strong 20, 20. Uh, yeah, I mean, Matt's been on sabbatical for a couple of years. He's basically burnt himself out with the amount of work he was doing. Oh, okay. Because um, he was contributing a lot to open source projects. Mm. Um, so, uh, but it, that's fine. That was going to happen anyway. It's just a matter of um, extreme load of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. So, and, and, and is he okay now? Is he getting better? Or is... uh, yeah. Yeah. I think he's actually thinking about um, 
working on some new project stuff that he's been considering for some time, which is okay. another open source project because we're very, very into that sort of area of working mm. and into that um, whole dynamic. So we contribute quite a lot of community code. Perfect. Okay. And then, so uh, since obviously you talked about the technical side of it and, and have you, I take it over the last few last 20 years you've learned a lot yourself in terms of to help evolve and build the business. I think so yeah I also did a couple of college courses on things like project management right so you I've actually pick up on how to run projects properly right. um and do a lot of reading around the area these days I tend to when I'm I, I do do um touch code again I'm touching mostly frameworks in the front end so what right. we call client side code okay so um, yeah, mostly UI, not really UX, but you get elements of UX, but mostly what I'm doing is placing things on a, on a page and then somebody can do the design, the pretty graphic on top of it. Right, okay. Okay, cool. And so um, over the what, what are the things you really enjoy about what you do within the business? Oh, what do I really enjoy about the things I do? I actually like organizing things. I'm weird this way. I don't mind farms. In fact, I think a really well-designed farm Mm. And a well-designed survey is a beautiful thing to behold, which right. I guess places me in a very small select number of people who doesn't mind filling out a farm as long as it's pretty. But that has the opposing thing of when it's badly designed farms that they're asking questions that seem to my mind not to fit the purpose of the farm. I get very irritated at it. So it's the organisation. I, I like tasks and I like tickets and I like long lists of schedules. I mostly like ticking them off. Right. It's nice when you make a list of tasks and you, you then tick them off and they can tick off the main task you, you've achieved and gone on yeah, yeah. So building up project milestones building up uh, project graphs and seeing them pass through is useful i also generally like talking to people so talking to a lot of people yeah that, that can be good obviously it helps with sales and and, and lead generation and stuff like that so yeah that kind of contact so and then Within the business yourself, obviously, um, what makes what do you think makes you kind of stand out or, or different differentiates you from other you know competitors in the same sector? Um, that's a very good question. That, strangely enough, with there's a probably just a small number of companies that work like we do. Yeah. Um, in the same sort of area, um, you all either get very very big what I call code factories where there's lots of developers working in the same one building. Mm. And then there's a few that work like us, like smaller consultancies. And what sets us apart is generally that we're using distributed um, employees. Um, I used to distributed systems. And I think a lot of that comes out of community software. So almost all the businesses who operate like us are businesses who have a strong link to community software and open source software. And not in the way that, say, Facebook does, which is Facebook built itself on open source and then built its own variant of that open source, which they kept in house and then released to the world. And that's that's useful for a Facebook model, but it doesn't have a massive uptake outside of Facebook and Facebook applications. Right. Because what they've done is they've constrained the open source code that they created to fit very much within their ecosystem. Right. And that doesn't necessarily fit within the ecosystem of another business. It, it can't be as easily translated to another business. Right. So, that's not a bad thing. And Facebook do contribute back a lot to community code, but their own big code block is pretty much designed for Facebook. Right. And so even though it is open source, it's designed for Facebook. It's in the same way that Apple have done this with their with their open source language. And Google have done pretty much the same somewhat with theirs as well. Um, in that it works very well in their ecosystem and to their mindset and the way that they develop and build things. But that may not necessarily work in a more generalized context of lots of different smaller organizations or medium-sized organizations. Yeah. And so what we work with is just a much more broader acceptance of open source code where you right. may have much larger libraries and code bases, but they're all more flexible because of that. Okay. And did you, is that something that evolved over time? Or is that something that you've always felt is, is what you kind of... So see? that's a, a strange thing. When I first started went into business with Matt, I, he had to persuade me to work in open source. Right. I, it didn't fit originally with my mindset. My mindset was sort of like, you know, you build something and then you get people to pay you for that thing. Right. Yeah. So like, you know, somebody makes a chair and then makes another chair, They people pay for that chair. They don't design a chair and say, go build your own chair. Right. Uh, that seemed to be, you know, where, where's money in there? Yeah. <laughs> it's an 
uh, it seems to be the antithesis of anything capitalist mm. is to do this is almost like a socialist model but it, in fact it's not it's more democratic capitalism okay. um because the the notion is is that yes you get um you give this thing away for free but not everybody can build a chair I, if i tried to build a chair i probably would be able to follow the instructions but unless somebody's cutting it and it's an ikea chair it's not going to come out looking as much like a chair Mm. Whereas I know the carpenter, given a design for a chair, is going to build this beautiful chair that really is a great piece of work. Yeah. And that's what it is. I think people who work in open source are more like the carpenters. You get the people who are actually specialists at implementing these tools and these designs. Yeah. And you're always going to have to have that kind of person. Otherwise, you're going to have a generalized approach to it. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So, yeah, that's an interesting way of putting it. It, yeah, it helps the... The late, yeah, some of itself is not as you know technically knowledgeable as yourself. It kind of make that makes a lot of sense in terms of trying to understand the difference. Yeah, I know. Yeah, very interesting. Cool. Okay. So, there's, a, there's a good model for this already in in existence. Yeah. There are about a billion cookbooks that you can buy. Yeah. How many of us are chefs? How many of us, you know, yeah. sell bread for a living or you know run our own business as a chef? We don't. Mm -hmm. Even though we've probably got the same recipes, we you know we can get the same recipes as the chefs get. Yeah, but you're yeah. not going to make it the way a chef does because a chef is going to be making that recipe a thousand times mm. and they're going to be improving it a lot and get it to just the right level and they'll know the exact timing for different types of foods and meats and whatever they're cooking with. Yeah, and that's the same model that open source is building. It's basically giving you the menu, doesn't yeah. give you the skill to make a good cake. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, fair enough. Uh, yeah, yeah, just, yeah, really, yeah, really interesting, really interesting. Cool. So in terms of your journey, the business journey, what's that been like so far? Um, so I would say a little mad. Right. Really. Um, because I started off working in the front end and then I ended up managing some people um, and running a lot of the interaction. It was It's a very varied bit piece role, mm. which is OK, because that can kind of suit my personality a lot. Um, but I ended up also working a lot before the what I, I like to call the big change, which was COVID happened. I was doing a lot of conferences as well. Right. So not just um, in terms of attending conferences, I mean, running and managing conferences. I probably, um, I organized a thing called the London Pearl Workshop. I did uh, that for 10 years and I, I did that on my own as well. So I organized an event that had between 250 and 450 people, one day event, absolutely free, but um, sponsored. Yeah. Um, and I did that for about a decade. I ran a couple of um, international conferences. Right. Uh, it was like uh, the um, things like the UK UUG, um, Flosh conferences, um, the um, Pearl Conference Europe, um, and along with uh, other things like dynamic languages conferences. I was part of the original conference that was now the big conference in Edinburgh that's run in August. I did a, a side piece with some open source people for that in the very first one of that. That was about 2014, I think. Right, okay. 2013. Um, so I, I did a quite a lot of conference organizing and um, working around the sort of fringes of open source. It was just stuff that open source people generally didn't do a lot because they're technically minded, but didn't have mm. didn't actually like going up to people and saying, you know, can you sponsor this event? And you can have your logo everywhere. They'd be like, can you sponsor this event? What, you want something for that? Mm. Whereas I'd be like, oh, but you know, we're going to put splash your name out on front and say that you sponsored it, um, which is the kind of thing that companies want. They want to be seen to be yeah. doing something sure. without any of the effort of doing it. So it, the, I, I think I was good at not just realizing that they wanted something splash, but also arranging the printing of things like banners and signs and making sure that they're on stickers and making sure that they're on flyers and leaflets, making sure they're on promotion, making sure that there's at least a press release that goes out that says that they're sponsoring the event. Mm. It's, the, it's the kind of thing that companies sort of expect to happen if they if they just present money and they go, there's the money, I'm going to go away, you're going to do the rest of it for me, right? Yeah, yeah sure. So that was, so that's, that took up a lot of your time. Is that what you were spending most of your time doing? Or? Well, it, I would say that, that was probably 20% of my time was right. doing that. The rest of the time was actually spent working with clients. Yeah. Okay. And how's the business grown over the, the last? Uh, well, it's not grown and shrunk. We don't really, um, in the past couple of years, it's shrunk quite significantly. Right. Um, but it, it sort of expanded up to a certain size and then shrunk again. Uh, there's been significant changes in a lot of the industry 
Right. Uh, again, I'm going to point to look at things like COVID made a massive shift in the whole industry in terms of technical industry and in consultants. Uh, the first thing that happened in COVID was not only were staff laid off from a lot of companies or they were put into furlough in mm. places like the UK, but any consultancy stopped yeah. almost, almost overnight. They just, you know, consultants were the ones to go. And when it returned, uh, we we came back to a world that actually started to, to bring in a lot more uh, machine learned automation. Right. So it, it seems that that's not really recovered from that before we then get hit with the whole next thing, which is the whole rise of machine learning and the rise of uh, large language models. Yeah. 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 So I, I, I would say that we're sort of uh, still treading some very, very heavy waters. Right. If you want to metaphor, it's, it's difficult time still. And I think in the industry wide, you can see that as well. They got massive layoffs at tech companies in America. Yeah. But that's still happening. So there's a lot of developers out in the field. Sure. So how do you how do you see that as a how do you see what's the plan or what what you're projecting to 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 ride that or how how you best to manage through that? So um, that's that's the difficult one. So at the moment, because it's so variable right now, I think the future is uncertain. Not just for us, but quite a lot of people in the tech industry and tech companies. Full stop. Yeah. And the whole of that area, it's the same kind of challenge that was faced. I think in the '90s when you had the rise of operating systems doing a lot of the jobs. So if you can remember way back when, mm. uh, you had a thing called shareware and freeware, which was all the little tools and utilities that operating systems just didn't have. Mm. And then the operating system started to merge them in, and all of those businesses, all those small companies, just disappeared almost overnight. And right. the same happened in games companies as well. A lot of indie developers disappeared, mm. and we're now seeing that happening with mobile phones with apps. When mobile phones first came out, they had very little functionality outside of the basic, it runs a phone. Yeah. And now the phone itself comes installed with pretty much 90% of everything you need it to do. What you add in afterwards, the tiny fun things. I, I don't know a single app that I use on my phone that's not a fun thing that I like, rather than something the operating system already does. Yeah. And you get the same thing with Google. And I think you're getting the same thing with development as well. Right. is that a lot of it's being automated away and pulled into things that automatically do this by right. creating these great big frameworks that can do things automatically. And they just um, repeat builds, like your Wix websites and your WordPress websites. Yeah. There is literally none of that that can't be 95% done by a large language model. Right, okay. Because it's, it's basically taking a design, slightly changing it, and putting elements on a page. This is why they can build websites really quickly in small applications, and people think it's intelligence it's not intelligence it's just a, a, it's just um, a pattern recognition of the most acceptable pattern that works the best way and that's all we've got at the moment we're not much further ahead in terms of artificial intelligence from where we were right uh, maybe five years ago but in terms of the technology changing and the automation of that model right way ahead we, we, we're like it's like a, a an epoch change in terms of the actual um, confirmation of the model. Okay. And so what that you got with that is that you get a lot of, there's a lot of global changes in terms of climate, conflicts. Then you have this large rise of automation, mm. the use of large language models, um, large use of machine learning for pattern production. You're getting this across industries. So there's now companies that bring out things such as um, auto building of bricklaying, so you've got bricklaying robots and they just need one person to come along after it and do the pointing and monitor it. Yeah. But then these machines can work on 50 houses at the same time yeah. and they build the whole housing estate and then you just get a smaller number of people to come and finish them off. Yeah. Um, so that's what we're in and that's bringing huge amounts of change and there's a lot of turbulence. I, I think there's also quite a lot of great potential in that. that um, I don't want to sound like I'm being just wholly negative here because it's not. Um, the field of the automation is actually now opening up what, what was a traditionally narrow field. You had to be a supremely good programmer to know what you're doing. It's taken away a lot of the um, repeat stuff and to a machine learning, um, which then opens it up to a wider audience and yeah. has a possibility of breathing a lot of life into a creative opportunity for people who would never really go down that route, can now express their creative abilities in things such as building applications or building websites or building interaction between things. Yeah. Um, my level I'm getting to here is that that means that we've got a wild west. 
So okay. there are cowboys and there are large people moving in to try and claim large areas of land. So you have big organizations. This is why lots of money is going into this. So OpenAI can ask Microsoft for 10 billion and get 10 billion. Yeah. 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 Um, Google can suddenly go, well, we're just dropping 10 years of research into a new model and calling it Gemini. Yeah. And they do that overnight. And there's huge amounts of money that's being done as they try to grab. And yeah. I feel that you also get that idea that there's also snake oil salesmen. AI is going to replace us all when it's not going to replace us all. We're back to that whole thing of you can get a machine to, pu to pump out a uh, hundred recipe foods that all look the same, but that's mass food production. Yeah. And that's not a restaurant level food. It's not going to be as good as you're cooking. It's not as good as home cooking. No. And it's not as good as a chef cooking, but it is mass production. And that's where we'll end up. Yeah. So I think, this is why I don't use the term AI. I use it, I think it's a buzz term. I'll, I'll use large language models and I'll use the term of machine learning and of automation, but I generally stick away from AI because I think you still need a human intelligence working with it. And I'm, ho I'm hoping that what that means is that the field will grow with the number of people who can come into it from different areas and different backgrounds and different um, knowledges and abilities and skills and bring something new to the whole field and change the whole field. So while I'm slightly critical of where we are currently, because I feel like it's a big, there's a big land grab going on and it's that Wild West um, metaphor being used. I also feel that, you know, out of things like the Wild West and the, the idea of a gold rush, which is what AI currently is, it's a gold rush. Mm -hmm. It did then form some levels of civilization and you had great things being built. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't have had the, the railway that crossed America without the gold rush happening. Mm -hmm. it, these things happen that way. Often the much more civilized use of the technology comes behind it. Yeah. And I think what I'm looking forward to is that civilization of the technology rather than it being the open field that it currently is. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's for us as a company, it's incorporating these tools, but doing it in a way that I feel is a much more balanced approach yeah. rather than just saying, right, well, I can lay off everybody I used to work with me and I, don't need to employ anybody ever again i'll just automate everything and yeah. then sit here and let the money pile up in my <laughs> massive bank account that's not going to happen no. but what i feel is that we can look at enriching people we work with by showing them how automation can be used um, intelligently which is what we've always uh, always done because yeah. uh, we're more interested in the idea of sustainability rather than just break and run which there's, there's this whole concept in um software development, there's a couple of different ways of doing software development. Things They'll mention things like Agile and the waterfall method, and Agile seems to break things and run. But it's not really, that's really bad. It's a bad sort of mindset to think of. And it's bad mindset to think of waterfall just being very, very long term. It's actually more to do about innovation and moving quickly into a new territory, but also having some mind about how are you going to support compatibility and backwards compatibility. Yeah. And so there's those two very distinctly different mindsets and you can fuse them together. You can break new territory and move forward, but you can also sustain and have compatibility with people and businesses you traditionally got. If yeah. everybody suddenly broke and broke new ground, where would our traditional business go? Yeah. We, we can't do that. So um, I think for us, it's a matter of incorporating these new technologies at a sort of gentler pace and a much more measured pace because um, we want to enrich and keep a compatibility and also you know show people how they can expand using the technology not contract because i think there's far too much focus being placed right now on one on just one one part of the triangle uh, are you familiar with a business triangle of the three ways to make money in business which is you either you know have more, more products get more customers or reduce costs. Yeah. And I think people are looking at AI and going, reduce costs. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. I think it should be, we should be focusing on the more products, not replacing your existing products with AI, but building new or different products using yeah. AI. And yeah, then really using the term that I hate, but there's yeah. your buzz term. So um, if I if I slip the word synergy in here, then mm. it'll go to pot. No, fair. But I think no. I mean, it's a lesson for any businesses. If you if you focus on cutting costs, then there's there's only a finite amount of costs you can cut, and ultimately, if you're not growing, right, 
you're dying and you know you've got to be looking at growing your top the best way to grow your profit is to is to grow your top it, it is that and, eternal problem that you got to keep on growing and I, I do dislike that it's a very it's a very entrenched capitalist model that doesn't work particularly well mm. with social models mm. um and i still don't think we balance that as as a society and never mind globally yeah okay interesting yeah, yeah no that makes sense. I, mean, I think my point there was the if you focus fully on the bottom line it that, that's a that's a you know that's a, just a, a disaster way to happen because you can you can so you yeah, see yeah evolving and, and ensuring that the the business suffices in in the way that the owner wants as well I guess in terms of you know the so when when you bring I mean what was this this uh, in terms of your the your the scale the size of your business at the moment employee wise do you have any employees or you is it just yourself and oh well yeah we use a I do have employees there's only actually um, three of us local to Lancaster but yeah. there's um sits in the team we've got another three people who work occasionally with us right um, but they're all distributed. So um, the furthest person away is in the US, but okay. um, it's uh, people in Europe and people in the UK, but not in the same location in the UK. No. And when you've brought those those people in over the years, what what what? How have you gone about ensuring you bring in people that? Or what kind of qualities do you look for people? When so doing- some of this is gained from people you meet in the community who are also contributing to the same things that you are, because you're contributing code to things that are being given away. Yeah. You went- forming relationships i've met some people at conferences um but it's mostly about people you already know about because they've been contributing to the same projects you have right. and, and we use a we're still a lot of us are still quite old and use online tools like irc instant relay chat which is a very old tool these days right. oh, it formed up out of a long time ago there were news groups yeah uh, but there are still channels where people talk and developers just talk and they'll ask questions so there are like help channels for a lot of the modules and a lot of the open source things. So you, you get things like Reddit as well as, you know, um, the other sort of um, website based areas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of stuff that's done on things such as Slack channels or Discord or IRC or Telegram, where you'll join various channels and talk to people and you'll get to know them that way. Right. Okay. There's uh, people who come to me via recommendation. Okay. And, and, is, and, and, uh... Is it that they share value, the same kind of values as you, as well as? It's mostly the the people who work either in open source or more happy working with an open source mindset and frameworks. Yeah. It's people who think that it's actually a good thing to work with open source software rather than proprietary software mm. because you are contributing, and they're also working with other people who do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Like contribute because um, there, there's a great sort of social link level where you can actually grab the person on an on a um, relay chat and say I, I understood you wrote this module it's absolutely fantastic i'm having this issue with it and i solved it this way and then the person will go oh that's great you push a patch for me right okay um and so you build up a, a, a kind of relationship with the people yeah, who yeah. Use the modules and whose work you're using they built it for whatever company they're working for yeah, yeah. so community is a massive i mean you mentioned it a few times but the community and, and working in that community is a really really important it is i mean the the community around developers and development is i think one of the essential things it's one of the things i i feel that very big organizations try to build it with inside their companies yeah so they, they try to have that community sense inside their companies and if they do it well and successfully people stay with them a long time if yeah. they do it badly people will move very very quickly away from yeah. them so um although i use what i would call subcontractors um, I've been using one of the subcontractors who's been with me since 2008. Right. Um, I, I, I've known them since 2005. So yeah. uh, it, it's a case of they, they basically just still subcontract for me because uh, we have a very um, shared value system, I guess, is the yeah. way of looking at it. Um, and also because I kind of like the way that they work, so they're positive and that's what you need because often the job calls for a lot of fast thinking or mm. you know, heavy, intense repetition of something or you're often trying to crack a really difficult problem where something's yeah. going wrong and you don't know what's going wrong. So having a good sense of humour can be a very big help. Sure. They're all creative people. Yeah. And I feel that people get it wrong. They look at people who are technical and they go, oh, they're not creative like me. I'm a creative, I'm an artist. Well, actually, a lot of software development is like art. Yeah, and it's repetition of tasks that builds up something that doesn't look like anything you started with. Yeah, and so it can be very, very similar. And also, the actual process that you do inside your head 
of solving the problem and seeing the end result without actually while looking at a blank page is very similar to what I think a lot of artists do as well. Yeah. So it is a very creative environment, um, but it's with people who also love solving problems and may have a technical way of solving problems, i.e. they have a logical way of solving a problem. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that artists don't do the same things. We have Bach Brandenburg concertos, which are palindromic. They're mathematical. Mm. And that's, that's art. Yeah. And a lot of art is to do with things like golden ratios. So photographers will tell you, especially that they, they will use golden ratios. They will use leading lines. That's all technical knowledge. Yeah. It's just you technical knowledge that's then used to build something that's creative and artistic. And I think a lot of programmers are the same. So we sort of are looking at people who are creative. And so they're like me, they're creative people, but they're just better at solving problems than I am. Yeah, um, yeah, so yeah. yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, good, yeah, a good point. Yeah, that you, you can't think you're one or the other, but you can be both at the end of the day in terms of yeah. skills. Uh, I think there are also people who like to learn. So a constant start search for more knowledge and more information. I've been very, very fortunate in that I have that kind of attitude. Mm. I think one of the things that's missing in our society is we don't pride that enough. We don't, um, I don't think schools get enough time to instill that just learning for learning's sake. Yeah. Knowing a thing just because you're knowing it. Um, I have this joke because I, I, I collect facts from everywhere and I read a lot and I call myself a suppository of all knowledge. Uh, because there's this thing of sometimes the knowledge is worthwhile for the knowledge's sake. Yeah. But, but just having that information is worthwhile in itself, whether or not you, you do something with it, because you don't always know the end point of the piece of information that you have. No. No, it's interesting. Yeah, like, yeah lifelong learning and, what, you know, the people that, um, you know, the m more successful people in the world tend to be people that continuously learn. Like, they, like, yeah. they, they read books, they'll just in, in educate themselves on so many different type subjects and just yeah. get that thirst for knowledge is, is, is you know, absolutely paramount in, in people as, uh, they, as they evolve. So, no. I think we, we, we face this challenge of, I, I mean, I look at my phone way too much and I look at my iPad way too much. I consume a lot of stuff online. But I think it's also, uh, there's a, a thing that people can learn from understanding their own knowledge. Yeah. So I'm fortunate in that I have a dog so I can walk the dog. And when I walk the dog, I'll do one of two things. I'll either walk in complete silence and not look at a phone or any device mm. at all. The phone won't come out of my pocket unless I something, see something to photograph. Mm. Um, because that just allows you to be, be inside your own head mm. and have nothing else to distract you because you're just throwing a ball for a dog. So th there's no distraction. There's just a, a, a thing wagging its tail and running around you. Or I'll listen to a book. Uh, so like uh, from Audible generally yeah, yeah. Um, but i'll listen to a book and i i tend to listen to a lot of um i, I consume some fiction that way but I, I listen to a lot more factual books yeah or books where they're autobiographies so i listened to the biography of number 10 which was boris johnson um that way and i did um david mitchell's unruly was the last one i just did i'm, I'm currently on i think james o'brien's book right um, which is how they broke britain and um, so it, the i tend to consume the more technical books that way because uh, they're nice to have somebody else taught knowledge to me yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's like walking with a friend yeah, yeah, yeah but it's walking with a friend but there's nobody with you so it's by yeah. the silence of, you, of yourself as well and, yeah. and the silence of your own company which i think is a good thing to have i think we all and we don't do that enough um yeah. i think people should learn to do that is you know not have the distraction devices and um, have the silence of themselves because you, you get to understand a lot of your own thinking that way yeah no absolutely yeah no yeah I think, you know, similar as in terms of, you know, when I'm walking a dog, I've always got, I'm always normally tending to listen to podcasts or, or, or a book and stuff like that. It, and, is, it is a good thing to do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And the fresh air and walking the dog doesn't look harm either. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. So, um, next question is like, so what would, would you say would be your biggest learning since you've been a business owner? Um, so, my biggest learning, I'm gonna to have to say I probably learned a lot about my own adaptability. Okay. I, I I already considered myself a bit more of a jack of all trades before I went into the company. Yeah. But um, I, maybe I used that more dismissively than I would do these days. Um, I used it as to to indicate you know master of not jack of all trades, master of none to indicate that that was a negative thing. Yeah. But I don't think the actual phrase means it in a negative way. I think it means that you do not focus solely on one thing and that you 
allow yourself to be adaptable to a range of things, which allows you to be creative and adaptable in those situations. And I think that's what I learned that I'm able to do. So I'm able to be a person that if somebody says, how does this work? I, I won't automatically know, but if you leave me alone with an interface of anything for 10, 15 minutes, I'll have found things in it and say to you, oh, you can change this. And then, well, why did you find that? Well, I just press things and open things and see where yeah. it was. And it's like kind of learning that I'm a, I'm, I'm a person who will like to fiddle with things very, very much. And I'm adaptable in that way. Okay. Um, and learning that where I, where my strengths needed to go is learning to focus more. Okay. And to push my focuses. So it's learning more about myself. So what business taught me is um, pretty much how adaptable I can be, how much I, where, I'm, where, where my weaknesses were as a, in personality. Mm. It also taught me that I'm, I'm, I'm a fairly, I guess, okay person to be around. Okay. Um, which, which is nice to know. So people seem yeah. to like me enough. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, yeah, the, with business, especially the businesses to a certain extent, you know, what you do and and you're the you're the front for the business then clearly the yeah. you're more personable and 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 you understand what people are looking for as well and, and you can build those relationships that's where business it is I, I think though but because i it also taught me that i have a lot of energy into things i can become egregious can become so digging into something right. so you become quite confrontational so right. I, I, I sometimes if i'm in the wrong mood do not set the feels very very right. well it, mm -hmm. Because it's just a case of well, no, why would you? Mm. Um, it, it it does um, seem that um, there are particular environments that foster that. So online things such as apps will foster that kind of attitude into me, yeah. where it riles me, where I get fairly wild fairly quickly. So thankfully, I don't go on that as much. Right. I because I, I prefer a longer form where you can actually explain yourself more. And I think if you have to explain yourself in a short form, yeah, you do one of three things, which is either being too nice too middle ground not saying anything or too aggressive yeah. because you, you can't change the tone of what you're saying no. you can't start off with a competition of i don't believe you because of this thing mm. and here's my reasoning you have to either say i don't believe you or you haven't thought of this thing or here's my reasoning you've got one of three you, you yeah. rather give the whole of the argument and nobody's going to read a thread of answers from you no, and you, yeah, I mean, like everything, isn't it? You know, the nuances of everything are, are important, and when people are just shouting, at each other, and I think that's where it loses it. And then also, you get that thing of people don't realize that capitalization is shouting. Yeah, they yeah. want to emphasize something, put stars either side. That's a bold reference, and they don't get that because they were brought up in the Usenet groups where that was used, and some of those things stayed with us. But of course, they stayed with us, and nobody taught anybody what they were. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely no it's uh, yeah it's it can be a bit of a rabbit hole isn't it, when you just kind of get lost in so uh, I, I, this is why i avoid it because I, I have this thing as well you have to model good behavior and if my behavior is not good then i'm not modeling anything worthwhile on that so i shouldn't be doing it yeah uh, even though i want to say no that's just bloody stupid <laughs> i shouldn't say no that's just bloody stupid because all i'm doing there is modeling the behavior that what we should do is say no that's bloody stupid as an answer yeah and so i have done that and I, when i think about it and reflect on it i think that's just totally the wrong way to do it no absolutely 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 um cool so and then in terms of if someone you know a young person is looking to start up their own business and get into something in whatever field it would be what would be your best advice to them run away <laughs> me um no uh, that's not fair um actually i would say straight away go to business meetings at your local colleges at your local when where councils do run them yeah. at things where they got business uh, young businesses because there's a lot there's lots of things where there's grants and there's help and there's free advice because yeah. they're not sometimes allowed to give you money but they will be able to give you advice and there's loads of these things you look in any area it says new businesses are allowed this amount because the council are given an X amount by the the, the government and it, and it varies, but say if the, if the councils were given a thousand pounds for any new business, yeah. they would hire an expert such as yourself um, to come and talk to a group of people yeah. and to give them some advice. 
And that is the best thing you can do is go to as many of them as you possible. Just sign yourself up for every single one. Go to all the business meetings you can. Yeah. Go and talk to other business owners because every single one of them, you say, I've just started in business, will take instant pity on you, you poor bugger. Because <laughs> you just started in business and they've all climbed that hill. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they know the roller coaster you are about to enjoy. And a few people get this stratospheric climb and everybody goes, that's what I want. Yeah. That is just such an inconsequential and tiny number of people in business yeah. that every business owner will be going, no, you're never going to get that. That's just, that's lottery win in business. Yeah. Don't aim for the lottery win. Mm. Aim for the, you're going to be in the 40% of businesses that do this or the 40% of businesses that manage this way. Yeah. You're not going to be in that 0.0001% unless you're stupidly lucky. And it is mm. just stupid luck. Yeah, I think you seem to go back to the point about knowledge and, and learning and a lot not, it's a really interesting point I think you make that people obviously start a business and they start the business in what they know and what they're doing, yes. but they don't learn about how to run a business. <laughs> That's, Indeed. Um, I think the other thing I would say is if your business is also your hobby, drop one of them. Either turn it back into being a hobby or make it solely your business because yeah. they can't be both and you're going to end up regretting that yeah. all the people i know who run craft businesses the ones that like it are the ones who went in to run a craft business because yeah. they were good at crafts and they do other crafts outside of it yeah those people who turned their, their i guess their their side hustle yeah. into their main job all end up regretting it because they don't do anything creative with their side hustle anymore yeah, yeah. that's an interesting point yeah yeah no. so kind of yeah focusing fully on one yeah. I think you've got to have that division. Yeah. yeah. So um, I make sure that the things that I do that I enjoy now are not things that I generally have to do in business. Yeah. yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Interesting. No, yeah. Some good points there. Some, yeah. Like I say, that in, increasing knowledge of, of the business and running and the strategy and frameworks of the business itself, no matter what the business you're in, is, is, is vital in terms of because if you start with the Start with the end in mind. It makes a massive difference to to how you, how yes, successful sir. you can be. So no, definitely cool. And then finally, um, intrigued to know what inspires you or what has inspired you. So I saw that question and I thought, you know, sunsets, puppies, kittens yeah. playing with balloons in the fields and meadows, yeah. <laughs> all the twee stuff you could have possibly imagined just came to mind. And then I could I could name quite a lot of great thinkers that I've admired over the time. There's some great writers I absolutely adore. And I think they were way beyond their time mm. and way beyond their thinking. Mm. Um, and so I, I could name those kinds of people. I'm a big fan of a lot of 19th century literature and 20th century literature. I read a lot of feminist literature that I really adore. So there's some writers like Jean Rice and Angela Carter, who are much of my favourites. Okay. And then writers like Neil Gaiman, but a lot of fantasy fiction and science fiction fiction stuff. So Asimov would fall easily into that if you were thinking that kind of way. And then I thought, you know, that's not really what inspires you on a day-to-day -day basis, though, is it? Okay. Because that's the actual interesting thing here. There's a lot of things you can read about people who do inspiring stuff. And yeah. there are a lot of people you read about. I do consume a lot of media. So I, I read a lot about these people who do either face challenges of health or life or social life. Yeah. And then they overcome those. And those are always really inspiring. Mm. And so we can all look to those. But um, aside from all of those people, it's actually a lot of the time it's the people I work with. Because I tend to work with intelligent people. Yeah. And I tend to also talk online to people who are knowledgeable, intelligent. And I get inspired by the level of breadth of their understanding of things. Right. So it's actually just it's the ordinary people you talk to and you think, well, that's fascinating. I didn't actually think of that point of view. Yeah. And it's it's kind of inspiring that people can have this very similarity to you and the very similar goals and lead it, life and even things that you do, but be utterly different people. And have an utterly different worldview to you, even yeah. if you've got a very similar life. And that's that's kind of inspiring. So I, I, I get inspired a lot and learn a lot from the interactions and conversations I have. And that really in a day-to-day -day existence, it's really just my family who inspires me the most. So yeah. um, my wife is a fairly inspiring person in that over the past um, 15 years, while working, she did her degree right. uh, and did her master's while working. 
And then she, we were fortunate, we went for a sponsorship and she's did her PhD, which she's now just finished. And she's now a doctor of psychology. Mm -hmm. um, she mostly focuses on um, the science side of psychology. So, um, but she works with um, autism and language. Right, okay. But she's basically become a, a doctor and a scientist. And at the same time, we've had three kids and, you know, there's the family life and the holidays mm -hmm. that you have as well. She's done that while, <laughs> while working and then while becoming a doctor over, over a long period of time. And it's been quite a long journey. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that's fairly inspiring that you see quite a lot of dedication goes into, into doing that and being that person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's complimentary and it helps, I think, that, as I say, I'm a person who can pick up a job and just do it, just pick up a task and do it. So um, it also helps that I like the cooking. But if, if there's a job that, that she can't do, generally she can just go, can you do this? Because yeah. I can't do it today. And that, that's something I can pick up. And I think that's complimentary. But it's also, it's inspiring to be around somebody who can actually, you know, do a full day of work and then come home and have to read a book on statistics. Yeah. And just to, you know, to sit there for three to four hours reading a book on statistics and, and compiling statistical models whilst you're being dog tired and while there's a baby screaming next to you. Mm -hmm. that's, that's fairly inspiring on its own. Yeah. So I'm, I'm inspired actually by a lot of the people around me. I can find plenty of stories of other people to be inspired by. Yeah. But I'm actually inspired, I think, more by the, uh, I, I would say that would be the ordinary. Yeah. Like the ordinary people doing that, ordinary job, but then also doing an exceptional thing at the same time. That you think, yeah. if I had to do that, just the sheer amount of work that's involved. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, I mean, I mean, blimey, what, what you just described is, yeah extraordinary to be you know to have to do all that alongside the day-to-day -day of, of a job and, and family life and and on you know try yeah. that's why you normally do the, the do that stuff when you're younger when you normally got it is why you normally do when you're younger so yeah, no, it's yeah to return to to college to university then and to the really into yeah. serious research yeah yeah no it's amazing to get to that i mean up to doctorate is just yeah yeah Understandable, fantastic. Some congratulations to her for yeah, thank you. Doing that. That's, uh, that's brilliant, great stuff. Okay, and then finally, um, in relation to to back to obviously your your job, your business, what, where, and you know, how can people find out more about what you do? What, you know, online. Oh well, this is really difficult. I always find that kind of selling what we do to other people really um, problematical because it's a case of we automate things. Yeah, uh, we build whole applications. I mean, if, if you ask me what we did as a job, yeah, um, is that we build whole applications, and we can build whole websites. And as a business, we build whole applications, or we can build just a single website. Yeah. But in terms of the applications, they're normally bespoke applications, and they're normally built to either replicate a whole set of processes that you might want to do, or replicate a whole business. So it could be the whole business application. So for instance, the latest one we've been working on is a survey company's survey. It's a different type of survey, really, um, in that they're not doing um, just quantifiable data, um, but they're taking a qualitative approach. And therefore, the application has to be built into the mind that at some point we'll be building in sentiment analysis, which will be done using uh, machine learning. And mm -hmm. that will be done with um, mostly linguistic analysis, which will be a large language model. So it had to be built from the start with that endpoint in mind yeah also building in the protections for things like data protection and um data privacy yeah. which is very difficult when you start interacting with large language models of, of what becomes used and not used yeah um so we we're pretty much at a, at a prototype stage in fact it's beyond prototype it's going towards becoming a SaaS product now right the prototype is working um so we built the whole of that and went through the whole process, managing all the, the whole project, working out what the client wants and what they wanted to build. And mm. they had a version one prototype and we almost completely threw that away and built an entirely new product. Yeah. Um, so that, that is basically from conception through uh, design, through um, build and then beyond. Mm. Um, and at the same time, we built a small website for somebody um, and we're kind of very flexible in what we understand and know about uh, the different um, models that you can use. So a lot of people will say, oh, we can build you this app. Yeah. Um, how does that app then work if you want to have a website? Well, it doesn't. You have to build a website separately. So you have a website and an app. 
No. Uh, what we build a lot of the time is in the mindset of, a, of the device is agnostic. So it doesn't matter what the device is. You should be building so that it works on any device and it's a single div thing that works on all devices. What And the advantages of doing that, there are disadvantages to that in that you have to stick within certain standards and you can't do all your pretty whizzy app things an app can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Without having to share um, with what a TV is possible to do or yeah, yeah. what a laptop is possible to do. So we, for clients, what we can do is everything from looking at your processes and saying where it can and can't be automated, mm. um, looking at how you can innovate on a lot of what you do currently. So you already have applications, you already have, say, a website. It's looking at how you can innovate and use that in a better way, how you can look forward, how you can say, we, well, we use our website and we capture this address from it and that's what we do. And then we use a sales funnel and you think to yourself, well, a lot of that you can automate away and also expand up. Yeah. How are you how are you working from that? How are you how are you moving it into other areas of your business and using that as a, a way of analyzing what people are saying through those areas? Yeah, yeah sure. In, in regards to your business, how are you comparing those and building up um, in that way you build up a database model and analyze and cross analyze the different approaches people have taken. Sure. So it's yeah, it's using um, automation to enhance. Yeah. Cool. Not and just to replace. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And just where would they, so if people want to get in contact and they're interested in finding out a bit more, where, where's the, the best place to contact you or connect? You? Um, well, there's a, aside from the form on the front of the website, you know, calling us, just, we go online and talk to a lot of people most of the time. Yeah. So I, I get, you get calls through basically from things like LinkedIn. Yeah. So then you get pushes in from LinkedIn or there's somebody will ask you on the website or generally a lot of our traditional stuff has actually come from people finding us online because we might have built the tool that they're using. Right. Okay. Cool. And just uh, find just wait, what's the the website address of the people if they want to... Um, so it, the, there were two, but it's shadow.cat. Yeah. We'll take you straight there or you can go to shadowcat.co.uk which is, you know, the official one but shadow.cat yeah. will redirect to us. Perfect. Great stuff. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Mark. Thank you. Really thank you, Rob. To, uh, to hear about you and the business and in what you've achieved over the last 20, yeah. 25 years. Um, yeah. And I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. I'm sorry if I waffled too much and back and forth. I, as I, I, did, I did warn you, I tend to wander around the path. Not a problem. Not a problem. It's all, all very interesting and, and, and much... Yeah, I'm sure the viewers will be fascinated with what you've gone through and, and, and described and um elaborated on you know exactly what you're doing and why you do it which is as important as anything so yeah no no problem at all great Thank stuff you. cheers mark thanks very much